welcome to the Feeling Lighter podcast. I'm Katie, and I'm with my fabulous co-host, Dr. Lisa Folden. Hey there. We, the purpose of this podcast is we are shedding old beliefs one episode at a time so we can just feel lighter. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you who don't understand that play on weight loss, we are not here for weight loss. We are here for mentality shifts that help us feel lighter because the bottom line is how you feel about yourself literally changes everything. Everything. How are you, Lisa? I am excited to be here, and I'm super excited for our guest. I am. Yeah, we're, we're starting off strong. I just want to take a quick chance to do a big shout out to the We Shape team. Yes. Um, because there's a lot of people behind the scenes. So much prep goes into this for months. Absolutely. And then we sit down, and we have. I have debilitating anxiety for three days leading up, making sure no one's getting ill, and we can all do this. <laughs> That's hard. Because um, we all have kids, and everything's crazy, but... We're here. Just excited to be with you, Lisa. Same. Last same. quarter went so well. It did. Okay, I'm going to dive right in. We're going to start this this time together off strong. <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to introduce Samantha Kelly. Um, I came across her Instagram. It's incredible. So uh, Sam Kelly is a therapist turned feminist coach for mothers. She empowers families to share the mental load together as a whole family team and break the cycle of motherhood burnout. It's like my love language right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, so many what? important things just in that bio that we're going to have to dive into. So first, I want to welcome Sam to the podcast. Welcome, Sam. Welcome. Thank you. So happy to be here. We're going to dive right in. Um, I got I to gotta just start off by, by asking this very important question. What is the difference between the mental load that mothers carry versus the physical load of running a home? Mm -hmm. and having okay. children. Such and an important question. That. Yes. And that's a really important distinction that I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand when we speak of the mental load. The mental load, like you said, isn't, it's not the physical tasks of mm -hmm. running a family, but it's the overseeing, the managing, um, the following up, the awareness of the physical tasks. The way I describe the mental load, it's like the engine under the hood that nobody sees because it's under the hood, but it's the engine that keeps the entire car running, the entire car and family moving forward always. So for example, like the mental load of parenting isn't the fact that like you have to break up another fight between your kids again. <laughs> it's the fact that you have spent hours consuming parenting books, Instagram content, you have the knowledge of how you want to approach that fight situation, how to help your kids mm. problem solve. And then also trying to balance like, okay, am I like doing this in the way that feels good to me and to my kids? And then when I mess up, then I need to like repair and go through that emotional labor for myself and keep myself in check and make sure that I have, I'm not projecting my own stuff onto my own kids. I mean, and that's just like the very, very, very tip of the iceberg of the mental load of parenting. The mental that's a big tip, though. Huge <laughs> like, tip. That's a lot. Huge. That is so much. Yeah. And you think so, of, like, how many aspects of your life there are. There's mental load for, like, grocery shopping. There's mental load for signing your kids up for sports. Mm -hmm. There's mental load for birthday parties. Like, right. it's so heavy and all-consuming. It's the constant to-do list running in your mind in the background always that you can never turn off. Yeah, I've talked about that book, Fair Play, on the podcast before. And... um the idea that women's traditionally women, I don't want to like make generalizations, sure. but traditionally women are holding so much in their minds. And then we're sort of like really looked at for the things that are like going on, but it's like, actually there's like 20 times that amount that's going on and not taking a break from that mental load is so exhausting in our house. Sometimes I call it invisible work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, What's difficult, and this is this is what I want to get into. So my partner and I have gone through a journey of me really for like two years trying to to communicate about this invisible load. And he's has double the energy that I do physically. So he's like, but look at all these things, right? So I'll just I'll fast forward and say he is in a place now where we share the mental load. So mm -hmm. props to him. That's awesome. But it it was a journey to get there. And I often wonder like how can we get our partners on board with understanding what this invisible work is, what this mental load is, without it potentially taking the two years that it took me? Like, how do we make this a little bit easier for partners to see? And then 
kind of second to that is why would they want to help with that? <laughs> like to me, when I'm looking at um, sort of this, like, like there, there's a lot of benefit that people specifically a lot of males benefit from women who come in and take on this invisible load. So yeah. what benefit do they have to say, let me pause, let me understand your experience and let me take some of that off of you because that's actually going to make their life harder. So I'm always curious about how to get people on board with something that actually makes their life harder. <laughs> Great question. Great yeah. question. And I think the answer is if we like look at that question and deconstruct it a little bit because okay. If we think about it in terms of, okay, it's my responsibility to get my partner to help me Uh. versus work with me, then I'm the one that's having to convince him to make his life harder. When if we like flip that script and put it towards ourselves, like, what would that feel like? That would feel amazing. Nobody, nobody, when I became a mom, Nobody sat me down and was like, okay, just so you know, things are going to get hard. Are you okay with that? Can I, can I like sell you on this and like get, like really encourage you to like participate in the level of work that is now required of you as a parent? Like that would be amazing. But no, like we didn't get that luxury. We didn't have that privilege. It was just Mm -hmm. like, here you go. Surprise, <laughs> nobody warned you, you're going right. to hate it. And, yeah. and like, to think that like, like, yes, like the fact that we as women have to be not only the ones that like it's had that experience that our mm-hmm. partners don't experience. And we have to do the emotional labor and work of being the ones who feel like we have to like move our partner through this journey to yeah. get them to where we want to be with us. Like that is just another symptom of the overall problem. And that is what we are wanting to like break the cycle for our children. Because I don't want it to be this thing because I'll I'll admittedly say that my process in trying to get my partner on board was kind of filled with frustration and resentment and like, come on, like me versus you. Uh And it was a great learning experience. But if I had a redo, I'd be like. How do I collaboratively do this in a way that it doesn't feel like, well, I'm doing this and you're doing this and it becomes this competition. So yeah, I do think it is a symptom of like, well, the fact that I even have to be the one who's educating, be the one who's doing the emotional labor to get you to see the value is a symptom of the problem. I just, I, I just wonder like, okay, so where do we go from here? So like you have a new mom, she has a baby, all of a sudden she's like, oh my God, I had no idea that I was taking on this mental load. Like, what would you tell her to do? She's already overwhelmed. She doesn't, how do you, where would you tell that person to start? Right. I mean, addressing this with an adult partner is like a whole thing and very, very layered. And to like speak to your point of the fact that it took so long, I think it's important to understand that we are dealing with ingrained generational beliefs. Yeah. And that is not like, like a quick fix. Yeah. It's just not like my, like I, I am a ther- like therapist trying to coach. Um, my husband would describe himself as like very progressive, a feminist. It still took us a year plus of like, this is what we are mm-hmm. focusing on with like laser focus. And we are still like doing that back and forth dance. And so I think that that's sense. just part of it. But like the anger that you talked about, um, I think women's anger, women's rage, can be felt and when we get curious about it can be one of our greatest teachers because it's the signal that like, "Mm," like something is not right here. There's Mm -hmm. like an unbalance, something's wrong. Something needs to be paid attention to. And when we can channel that anger, when we can channel that rage, it can be really, really powerful. So the way I like to tell people to approach it with their husbands is like you were saying, like, it's not, we don't want to create this dynamic of me versus you. Right. It's trying to help them understand that it's us together versus this common enemy that we all have men and women, which is patriarchal Uh structures, oppressive patriarchal systems that tell women it's their job and men that it's not tell women that or tell men that they're just helping. Versus, no, 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 this is, this is not my work. This is our life's 
work. Like you become a parent. This is what comes with it. You don't get to opt out of life work. And it's not like, you know, like this is a whole team effort. And it's the patriarchal messages that have set us up to fail here. So we need to come together as a team to fight against that. That's so good. I like that you say channel that anger because there's so much like negativity associated with women's anger, you know, around certain things. It's kind of like suck it up, you know, move on, get Mm -hmm. over it. You signed up for this. Nobody told you to get married and have kids and all these Mm -hmm. things. And you just feel so almost shame for like yeah. being upset and being stressed out and and letting it impact other areas of your marriage or your relationship. So I love that you are are like channel that and use it to help repair things. What it sounds like you're saying though, is a lot of work with adults, right? Especially adult yeah. men. But it sounds like, and what I get from your Instagram that I love, by the way, is that the teaching really needs to start when we're talking with the babies, like it has to start with these little people that we're raising so that they see a different, a different path. Can you talk more about like how we're instilling this in our children so that they don't grow up and repeat these same cycles that we're going through? Right. Of course. So I just like, as a little backstory, I grew up with what would be termed by, I think most people as like, and what I interpreted as like a very equitable partnership. Both of my parents would take turns working and kind of trade off being like the stay at home parent. Um, So like there were times where my dad was the stay at home parent and my mom was working. There were times when um, my dad was working and like fulfilling his dreams and my mom would work or or, excuse me. Yeah. Fulfilling his dreams, not working. And my mom would be the stay at home parent and financial provider. So it was like this very beautiful, like back and forth thing that they did. Um, But what was interesting was I still grew up, got married, had kids, and still one day, like 10 years into my parenting journey, woke up and was like, I I can't do this anymore. Mm-hmm. I am being crushed. It just happened. And the reason why I took on the mental load while growing up, seeing a really beautiful example was that nobody talked to me about the mental load. Like there was still no warning. There was still no discussion about it. And I think primarily because our parents' generation didn't have probably the vocabulary for it. They didn't have the words for it. Um, But we do now. Mm -hmm. And now we can understand and we can name it. And um, that's what's so important that we teach our kids. Because yes, it's so important to um, be an example and be a healthy model but we have to give them the words Mm -hmm. to understand the experience so they can have the language and the awareness around this whole situation. So they can not only be empowered right now to work together cohesively as a family team, but then also in the future, they can be empowered to choose something different. So my daughters can have different expectations. They're not going to be like completely taken by surprise. They're going to know what's coming. They're going to be able to communicate with that, that with future partners. And my son is not going to have the expectation that the woman is just going to do everything. And he just gets to like, peace out, Hmm. like emotionally, mentally, whatever. Like my son is six years old. He can use the term mental load, carrying the mental load in accurate sentences and applications. Like he gets it. Because I've given him the language that makes sense for him, that is appropriate for him at his age to understand and be empowered by. What is that language? Can yeah. you write a book? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to buy your book. I need the manual today. Yeah. Thank you. Wow. Well, I do. I have an audio course that oh. one of the parts of the audio course goes through all of these scripts. And they're very clear, they're very succinct, and they're age focused from toddlers oh, no. all the way to teenagers. I love so, it. like, I'm taking that mental load off of mothers. So, you don't have to just like figure out how to say that all in ways Wonderful. that kids understand. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> I've, I've done that. I've got you. Thank um, you. So, anyways, yeah. <laughs> I, so, this is making me, this is always going back to like why we're doing this podcast mm-hmm. because some beliefs that we have, we don't even know that we have. That part. So, I didn't know that I had a belief that it was my responsibility to do everything. 
And I grew up in a more traditional home where my father worked and my mother stayed home. But I will say when my father was home, there was a ton of teamwork. He did homework. He did bedtimes. He did baths. He did cleanup. Like he's very involved. So I was modeled that. And I will say that is probably the the whisper that has come through me Mm -hmm. is like, wait a minute, this didn't feel like your childhood in the (laughs) beginning, right? So that whisper was there, but I, I didn't even know I had the belief. So one of the things I want to really communicate on this episode and through this podcast is it's okay if we didn't know we had that belief. But just like you're saying, Sam, if you feel any bit of that like frustration or anger or resentment inside because you feel like the load of the the home isn't fair, that's indication that we need to kind of pause and look into that further. And I want to give people permission to say, look, there is a huge thing called mental load. You're likely carrying it all. And we want to give you permission to evaluate that and to maybe shift your belief on the fact that you have to carry it all. So if, mm. if we walk away from the episode with that one shift in 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 perspective, that would be success to me. Like, Agreed. are you carrying more of the mental load? What is the mental load? And we want to give you permission to evaluate that a little bit further. So you talk about this this language, and I think it's this noticing and doing. Yeah. And um, I haven't gone through your course, but I just had this like understanding of like the basic concept of noticing something and doing something. And I have been trying it with my 10 year old daughter. (laughs) And I I was like, oh, um, my 10 year old is neurodivergent. She's not going to really get this. And then I would see your post like even neurodivergent. I was like, okay, Katie, you don't have an excuse for this. So I just tested it the last couple of weeks in preparation for this podcast. And the funny thing is, is I just say this, and you could correct me if I'm wrong here, Sam, because I haven't gone through your course, but I just say, Ellie, can you please go in your room and notice something and do it? And actually, it works even better than me saying, go clean up your desk. specific thing, Because she gets to feel like she gets to choose what it is. So she feels a sense of like, you're not telling me what to do. And Mm. it freaking works, people. That's good. I haven't tried it that way. I like that. (laughs) She just goes in her room and she notices something and then she does it. There's no fight. There's just, and I had a very small conversation. I, and and again, I'm going to take your course, but it was like, Hey, Elle, I just want to share that like all the chores and stuff that mama has put together for the house. It's so much more than that. I have to think about the chore. I have to put it on a chart. I have Mm -hmm. to, that's like all the stuff that goes in my brain. And I'd love for our family to come together to figure out how we can all understand all those parts. So if you could just notice something and then do it, it's so powerful for our family. And I just said that. And then I just have been saying, can you go in your room and notice and do, or before we go out on this trip that or this plan for the day can you notice something around the house and do it before we go it's incredible yeah I'm a fan can you talk (laughs) a little bit about that process or even how you even came up with that idea because as soon as I saw that post I just I just was like overwhelmed at this thought like oh I don't have to create this like big chart and say do this on Monday and do this on Tuesday and oh you didn't do it so you don't know iPad today that that was so much I gave up I gave up like two weeks late like I can't yeah I am not the police like yeah (laughs) monitor your every move all the time so can you talk a little bit about this concept of noticing and doing and how it's how it helps like obviously yeah (laughs) yeah of course so the way this came about was I had been like I said working on the equity in my uh me and my husband's relationship for a little over a year um, and it was a Friday night and I was making like a Saturday chore to do list for my kids. Mm-hmm. And I just had this like really big, like light bulb aha moment where I was like, what am I doing right now? Like I have spent the last year of my life trying to teach my partner how to not rely on me to make him a list in order to be able to contribute to the house. Why? Am I teaching my children to rely on me as the woman, as the mother, to make them a list in order for them to contribute to the house? So, like, I just said right then and there, like, we're done. Like, F this. We are not doing this anymore. And it was a very, like, fly by the seat of my pants situation. I was just kind of making it up as I go. Um, But I recognized that what I've been trying to teach my husband was, like, this is how you notice things. These are the things I notice for a single load of laundry. This is how you can notice for a single load of laundry. Um, And so I just brought my kids on Saturday morning. I said, hey, guys, 
um, we're not doing chore charts anymore. We're not doing lists. And here's why. And I kind of gave them that explanation, similar to how you did with your daughter, just pretty brief, pretty simple. And we later dove into different things about like what it means to be a cycle breaker and what equity means and what um, burnout means and what mental load means. But for just to start, just talked about the importance of being able to notice um, and what they can notice, how they can notice. And we just completely flipped the chore chart system on its head and start, moved from the traditional chore chart to what is now notice and dues. Um, and then I created like a whole structure and system that teaches them not only the noticing skills, but also the age appropriate cleaning skills. Uh. So they can, because it's one thing to notice a bathroom. It's another thing to know how to clean a bathroom. And then vice versa. It's one thing to know how to clean a bathroom, but it's an entirely different skill set to notice on your own when the bathroom is dirty, when it needs to be clean, what you're looking for, and then to be proactive and take the initiative and do it. So it's those two skills working together always um, that creates empowered kids who are able to do things in the managing of the home without needing to be asked or made a list or begged or bribed or whatever. Bribed. Heavy on the bribing. <laughs> yep. Oh my Fear gosh. Bribes. <laughs> Jeez Louise. This is just such an, imp- I mean, I just, I feel like I'm just like, this is such an important conversation. Yeah. I mean, the way I even have like a visual for it is that like, I have like a thousand tabs open in my mind and it's this idea of like anticipating other people's needs. Yep. Mm-hmm. And like we are conditioned as women to like anticipate other people's needs. And I do think most men are conditioned to think about their needs. And I do think it takes time <laughs> to shift that. And again, I want to say like the patriarchy hurts men too. It does. So it's yeah. not about blaming. It's about saying we all grew up in these constructs. Can we come together? And can we say like, no one's really benefiting. It doesn't benefit. Maybe I'm answering my own question here in the beginning. <laughs> it actually doesn't benefit my partner if I'm angry and resentful. That's that not part. a connected, authentic yeah. relationship. It benefits if I feel supported, if I feel seen, if I feel cared for, if I feel like we're sharing in this load. Mm-hmm. And so that's maybe how we can have some of the conversations around shifting this because I'm constantly in this like, how do we get people who are benefiting from the system? to want to to help when they then won't benefit from the system. It's like, I do think it's kind of a tricky um, conversation, but I can say that when we can have those conversations and when we can be seen in that, there is less resentment and anger and frustration and more ease in the relationship. So my hope is that if men happen to be listening to this, maybe that would, you know, we can all feel when mom's not doing well. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. That is an energy mm-hmm. to maybe <laughs> not want to be a part of. So I don't know. Hopefully that may be a, a piece that can inspire men to say, hey, you know, I care about my wife and I or my partner and I want to help in this. And I and I didn't realize that she was caring so much because I see this like every time another one of my friends has a baby, I get so excited for them. But on the inside, I'm actually clenching mm-hmm. and I'm yeah. getting very tense for them because I'm like, oh, no, shit's about to hit the fan for you. Yeah. Like, and of course, I'm not going to say that to them because like that's not supportive. But it's like, you know, like I have yet to see one woman have a baby and not go through this massive like, yeah. wait, all of this is on me now. Like I have yet to see that. So and maybe I don't I don't know. Maybe I, I don't want to make... need to have those. conversations. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, and that's part of being like cycle breaking. It's like the yeah. opposite of rug shoving. It's the opposite of ignorance. It's having an awareness around something and it's making the choice to confront it, however difficult or potentially messy of a process that may mm. end up being. Um, it's saying, I don't want this for myself. I don't want this for my family. I don't want this for my kids. I don't want this for their future. And I'm going to do what I can to resource myself, whether it's through getting education, knowledge, whatever, even if it's just a little bit. So I know how to break this cycle because it's one thing to like, we can know that there's a problem, but if we don't know what to do or we don't feel like we have the support or resources to confront it, 
which is a huge problem. I mean, at the core of this motherhood burnout issue is like, we can like make the health, give ourselves healthier habits and like better systems and more effective ways of running the household right. all day long and like self care up the wazoo. But at the end of the day, like it comes down to like, those are just band aid things on an yeah, underlying right. problem. Like we cannot like girls night out this situation away. We cannot <laughs> Netflix binge this problem. So this is a value shift. Looking, yes, and looking at these root underlying issues and confronting that instead of just like it's fine. And look at it; it's too hard. And at the same time, like all the compassion and empathy in the world for the fact that we, as women, like we we're talking about, we have to carry this load. And we have to be the ones to do the work to confront it. Break the like cycle. That's a yeah. lot and it's huge. Yeah, it is. Yeah. And I think that, yeah, giving a lot of kindness and compassion for all of the women out there who do feel just so burnt out from this mental load. And also, you know, just just giving that kindness. And then like if I had a redo, I, I don't really believe in regrets. I think that everything is happens as it should. But if I had a redo, I think I would have acknowledged that frustration and resentment. Yeah. And then I would have seen how I could have shifted that into vulnerability. It was like I it's like I got too far down the justice path. <laughs> I'm an Enneagram one. And so I'm like, that's my path. Um, but if if I could have gotten not like I think this is what we do too we get we have so much tolerance until we don't have tolerance and then it's like That's whoa and then the anger does take over and then it becomes a battle but if I had a redo and there was even like a little bit of anger or frustration or resentment I wish I would have paused and said how can like you're saying Sam how can I use this as fuel yeah. and then how can I shift this into vulnerability and how can I have a more vulnerable conversation yeah. with my partner, not an angry mm -hmm. argument that, that says, I'm suffering here. Yeah. I am noticing this. I'm noticing that. I'm thinking about our culture as a whole. I'm thinking about the family. Like there is this magical thing that sometimes I do and, and, and my partner does where sometimes we go, when I was a child, this happened to me. Mm -hmm. And this is like, so like when I, like I would tell him when I was a child, I was the only girl in the family. And even though my father was very involved in the household work, I was responsible for doing like 10 times more than my brothers. My brothers had like mm -hmm. one chore each and I had like 10 chores. Mm -hmm. And even as a 10 year old, I would go to them and say like, this is sexist. I, this is not I fair. That. And they were like, we don't know how to handle this child. But mm -hmm. That's not my point. My point is like, this goes deep for me. And I started noticing it when I was a child and it's really hard on me. And it brings up a lot of pain. And I would love to know that we could come together so that I can get a little bit of support because I do really feel like I'm suffering right now. Mm. And had I been able to kind of have that conversation a little bit sooner, I do see how we would have been able to shift maybe sooner. I think I sat in anger a little bit too long. Um, but I, I like the idea of like checking in and not and not doing what you're you know, what you're saying, Lisa, is like we don't want to accept women's anger. But it's like, how do we use that anger and then connect with partners in a vulnerable way rather right. than use that anger and then create fights, right? <laughs> I think it's a tricky dance, but mm -hmm. I do think if we can show up and acknowledge that and have space and kindness for that and then transfer that into some vulnerability and have these conversations again. And like you said, Sam, this is, this is generational. This is constructed into how we are raised as human beings mm -hmm. in, in terms of male and female. And this is not going to happen overnight. But I just appreciate the work that you're doing because talking about it and giving women permission to have these conversations, even if it's just to start with themselves, is so incredibly powerful. So um, I'd love for you to share with our listeners where they can find you. Because I think so many of the people who are listening here are going to, I'm going to take this course that you have. Like, it, it, I need the language. I need the tools. And I thank you for taking that mental load off of me. <laughs> so maybe let's start with that. Where can everybody find you? So I'm on Instagram at Sam Kelly underscore world. Um, and that's where they can, you know, access all my content. I mean, just in my free content alone, there's so many tools and tips and like, different like mindset shifts and ways to approach things that actually get to the root of the problem, like you're talking about and ways to empower your children to notice what needs to be done in the home without waiting to be asked. Um, and then my course is called little cycle breakers. It's an audio course. Um, and it's, 
it's basically like a private podcast. So it's like a six part private podcast. You throw in your earbuds, you can listen to like an episode or lesson, whatever you want to call it. Um, and it takes you step by step through this process. Like while you're folding laundry, doing the dishes in the drive through lane, lane, carpooling, whatever, um, going on a walk. So you can actually like consume this information, um, and then turn around. And really easily, like I cannot stress enough how important it was for me to make this easy and doable um, for women who are overwhelmed, exhausted, burnt out. Um, so it feels supportive and they can actually start seeing changes, like real, real changes. And it's so incredible because again and again, like my DMs are just filled with women who have taken this course that are like, I can't like, like, this is incredible. I can't believe it. Like, I'm already done with the course. I've already listened to it. <laughs> and we're seeing shifts. We're seeing actual shifts. And I can see how it's growing and getting better and better and better over time. And it's sustainable. And it's not that hard to right. make massive changes in very simple, clear ways. And I just want to say this could be an incredible opportunity to say, actually, I do want to have this conversation with my partner and to bring in this resource that you could use together. Would you be willing? Yep. I don't know what to do about this problem, right. but right. I have found Sam and she has a couple of resources. Would you be willing to go through this course with me? Right. And so what a, this is a great opportunity to, to be able to like invite your partner in to just listen yeah. and to yes. just see if we can start talking about this. It doesn't yes. have to change overnight, but what an incredible resource. Um, so we will actually include your Instagram handle in our show notes. But before we let you go, Sam, we ask a very important question on the podcast every time. Yes. Um, what is a belief that you once had that you no longer have that has impacted your life in a really meaningful way? I would say the day that I decided to stop believing the lie that this is just the way it is. That this is just the way it's supposed to be, or this is just the season of life I am in, or this is how it is for everyone. And, <laughs> and instead decided that I don't want this for yeah. myself. I am no longer willing to sacrifice my life experience on the altar of motherhood. And mm. that I get to be a person, a whole, full functioning person and individual completely separate from my identity as mother, wife, whatever. And that my life experience right here on its own is worthy and deserving of any and all shifts that we need to make to improve this. Are you still taking clients? Sam? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I feel like we're done for like the year here. I, 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 that is an incredible shift and in how empowering for the rest of us to have permission because I don't know about you, Lisa, but I have had all of those dialogues. Well, all women go through this. It's just a season. In other words, suck it up. That's, yeah. That's what I'm yeah. telling myself. In suck other words, up. what's your problem? You're not yeah. worthy of the thing that you want, the mm. thing that you need. Yep. And so what an inc incredible shift. We're so grateful that you joined us and gave our listeners permission to think about this more. Again, we'll include your, your social handle in the show notes so people can access your audio course. Thank you so much for the work that you do, Sam. You are breaking cycles yes. and changing people's <laughs> beliefs. And we're so grateful you joined us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.